We're returning at least one more time with the XT series, and this time it's with a heavy tune on the 3600 XT, with which we had the most success overclocking when we did our reviews. But unfortunately, a simple all core OC isn't really good enough to do much with Ryzen CPUs in the current generation. So we've done more. We've picked up our kit of uh, Trident Z Royals that are rated for 4000 C15. And we used these previously to get down to CL10 with 2666 for an example. And we've done other stuff with it too. So we took this, we applied it to the 3600 XT. We heavily tuned the memory and the timings uh, all the way down to secondary and some tertiary. And we also did Infinity Fabric clock tuning that we talked about originally in the 3600 XT review. So now we can see if it can climb the ranks at all. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly's Conductonaut Liquid Metal. Conductonaut is what we've used in all of our liquid metal and D-Lit thermal tests, capable of dropping CPU thermals significantly when replacing the stock thermal interface. Lower CPU thermals don't just allow better overclocks, but also lower noise levels because the transfer efficiency is increased. The mix of gallium and indium makes for a thermal conductivity of 73 watts per meter Kelvin, outclassing traditional pastes significantly. Learn more at the link in the description below. As a reminder, getting into this, some of the most interesting stuff for the 3600 XT was at the front of the review. A lot of people skip that and go to the game charts, which is unfortunate because you're doing yourself a disservice in terms of knowing about the product. But the most interesting stuff was in the, the T-Die graph that we showed, where you can maintain a higher frequency, 4.6 gigahertz all core, at a lower voltage than even the previously uh, lower frequency at a higher voltage that you would have on something like a 3600. That was the biggest improvement. We plotted T-Die and showed off how thermally there's a benefit, but in terms of out-of-box performance, there wasn't a lot to do with the parts. And our conclusion was if you're into enthusiast type overclocking, tuning, tweaking, like you want a project car, something in your garage to work on on the weekends when you have time, then the 3600 XT started to make sense. But stock, we couldn't really justify it versus AMD's own 3600 or the 10600K if you're really just going after gaming. So for this one, a quick overview of what we did. We did try Infinity Fabric overclocking on all three of the XT CPUs we have. We got all of them up to about 1900 megahertz. Previously, our first generation of review samples for 3000 series was doing about 1800, 1833, one time maybe 1867. That was about the best we got. We have not hit a 2000 megahertz IF clock chip yet. We've seen a lot of people asking about them, but we don't have one. So with VDDG of about uh, 1100, well, 1000 to 1100 millivolts, in BIOS, that gets us stable at 1900 on the 3600 XT. SOC we mostly left alone, is about 1.2 volts. V-Core we could do between 1.3 and 1.36, depending on what kind of clocks we're trying to, to maintain and what kind of workload. So 1.36 was kind of the worst case scenario, but we could hold 1.287 V-Core get in a lot of applications. And then for memory, to just quickly go through the list, uh, some of the stuff we changed included Obviously, CAS, we brought down to 13, RCDRD 13, RCDWR 13, TRP 13, TRAS 28, TRC 38, TWR we left auto for this one, could maybe do something with it, but that autoed out to about 30. TCWL we brought down to 10 from 13, TRD underscore S was 6, underscore L was 6, uh, TWTRS was 5, TWTRL was 12. TRFC was 264, 172, 132. TRTP was 12. TFAW was 20. We brought TFAW, or 4 Active Window, down from 48 was the auto setting. So 20 is pretty good. It, it looked like it would hold about 18, but we ended up going with 20 for the testing. And some of these timings, uh, there's a couple more, I guess. CKE was 6. Some of these timings, to give you an example, basically what, what I did was I sat there for most of the night, and I would change one timing, boot in, run a quick memory, benchmark in ADA. It's not the best tool in the world, but good enough to get a quick verification. Then we would use Memtest Pro, which is fantastic software. It's like five bucks. Uh, we've used it for a long time. So not really sure who runs Memtest Pro, but it's great for verifying if everything works. We'd recommend it. And the end result was for each one of these changes, sometimes you'd see less than 1% change uh, in, in score for the mem test and then add it all up and it, it does start to matter. So we did run 1.5 volts for the memory. It was mostly stable at 145, but 15 just made it flawless. We ran 3800 megahertz for the frequency and then we did have gear down mode on. This is really important. Uh, Buildzoid actually talked with me about this and helped explain some of the functionality to me. Gear down mode, to my understanding, is specific to AMD Ryzen platforms. And what it does is it'll jump to the nearest stable even value if, for example, we're running CL13 with gear down mode on, it might actually be something like 14, like 14 
uh, for for CAS, for example. But it doesn't change all the timings. So you might end up with like, uh, I don't know if it's 13, 14, 14, or 14, 13, 13, but it'll be uh, tuned a bit to help with stability. So the timings that I just read through are what we set, and then what you get might be marginally different, but the end result is a pretty good overclock. Couple of final notes before we get into the charts here. So first off, we're not memory overclocking experts. We've gotten better at it over time, but obviously there's, memory is probably the one where there's the most to learn, and it's overwhelming. So what we're going for is overall improvement, but if you're someone like Buildzoid, you could probably do a lot better. Uh, so where we are is, is probably about intermediate to most of the audience level. Probably a lot of you haven't gotten this far, and some of you have gotten further. Uh, for multiplier overclocking, CPU overclocking, I'd say we're we're probably at the the higher end of skill level, not quite to pro XOC or territory, obviously. So that gives you an idea for skill level. It is not too hard to do this stuff. It's just patience and trial and error, and you could definitely do better than we did. But we're pretty happy with it. I basically spent most of a day on this, and these are the results. Also, the charts will be focusing mostly on the 3600 and the 10600 CPUs. We do have 10600K tunes in here as well with memory, the same kit actually. This kit has been amazing. So uh, we use the same one for both of them. And some of the slower parts we've removed from the charts, uh, we've removed the 3800XT and 900XT just because they're irrelevant. So uh, let's get into the benchmarks. F1 2019 shows direct performance scaling and is an exciting game to use for this type of testing. But we have some more extreme examples later. The R5 3600 original stock result was 226 FPS average and 162 FPS for 1% lows, followed by the XT with an uninspiring 232 FPS average and 162 FPS 1% low once again. The Alcor OC got it to 234 FPS average, not that exciting. Our heavy tune moved that needle an additional 9.5% though over the Alcor OC, and that was from the memory tweaking. That's now ahead of the 7700K at 5.1 gigahertz and just behind the 10600K stock CPU, which leads by 1% in average. So both the average FPS and the lows are within variance of each other at this frame rate. The 10600K with its own heavy tune, although we could do a lot more work with it, landed at 290 FPS average, leading even the 10900K. The 10600K tune also leads the 3600XT tune by 13% stock with further leverage applied and 1% lows. That said, a 3300X with a quick 3666 one to one configuration scored 242 FPS average. So that is also a pretty close competitor to some of these numbers for a CPU that's so cheap. And that's why we were pretty cavalier with recommending the 3300X as a gaming CPU overall. And note again that this 3666 config isn't even one we'd call a heavy tune, it was just a quick one. XMP, higher frequency, and one-to-one -one on the IF. Moving to a 1440p test imposes something of a GPU limitation at the very top end of performance. So we'll be able to see if the 3600XT and 10600K can equate one another under GPU-bound conditions. The answer is no, at least not here. There's still some inherent overhead on AMD CPUs that limits their ascension in the ranks in certain benchmarks, like this one. Despite faster memory and infinity fabric, the 3600XT super tuned result lands at 214 FPS average, equal in average and lows to the 10600K stock CPU. The 10600K heavy tune leads this by 6.9%. We're limited by the GPU at this point, so a further lead is not possible without a higher end GPU. This is still sort of a realistic scenario though, because a lot of people do play GPU bound. The 3600XT Heavy Tune scaled over the original 4.6 GHz all-core result, which held 208 FPS average, so that's a 2.7% improvement. It's not really as exciting as in the other tests, and it's basically in line with what we saw out of the XT versus stock improvements in some games, so boring, in other words, for that amount of work. But the 1080p result was promising. In the Three Kingdoms campaign benchmark, we previously found that the game was one of the few in our suite that began to hit memory limitations at the very high end of the results. That became obvious when our 10600K 5.1 GHz with memory tune and cache ratio tune surpassed the 10900K with a simple OC at 5.3 GHz, but with memory left alone. For AMD though, memory almost universally shows this behavior in games. The 3600XT Super Tune result ends up at 136 FPS average, with 90 FPS and 77 FPS, 1% and 0.1% lows. That puts it about 9.3% ahead of stock and about the same over the 4.6 GHz all-core OC, both at around 124 to 125 FPS average. Versus the original 3600, the 3600XT Super Tune is 13% ahead 
As for the 10600K, our heavily tuned 159 FPS average result leads stock by 15.4% or its 5.1 GHz all-core result of 146 FPS average by 8.7%. For reference, the 3300X tune didn't do as much for us at 125 versus 124. That said, this is one that Patrick only applied XMP again and set it to one to one to one for a different content piece previously, so we don't have nearly as much time invested on the tuning for this one. It could be made better. Not shown here is the 3900XT with SMT off at 4.5 GHz. That was the only other part thus far to reach the level of performance achieved by the 3600 XT with its heavy tune. Shadow of the Tomb Raider positioned the 3600 XT at 143 FPS average with no gain to be had from a simple all-core OC. The 3600 stock was at 141 FPS average, and so the 3600 XT offered maximally a 1.6% uplift over the original part that's nearly $100 cheaper. Heavily tuning, the 3600 XT pushed it to 159 FPS average with an improvement in 1% and 0.1% lows as well. That's a gain of 11% over the stock XT, and ends up with the 3600 XT tune next to the 8700K stock CPU. The 10600K stock leads the 3600 XT stock by 13.9%, and it leads the 3600 XT tune by 2.5%. For the tuned 10600K at 177 FPS average, its lead over the 3600 XT tune is now 11.2%. So close to where the stock versus stock delta sits as well. The 10900K maintains a lead over this further with both stock result and OC results hitting the GPU limit. The 10600K tune is also against early limits of the GPU. The 3300X tune, for reference, didn't benefit as much since we only did some entry-level tweaking, but it shows the starting point. Hitman 2 was kept in this more limited suite since it normally is pretty responsive to this type of change. In this one, the 3600 original CPU did 114 FPS average, where the 4.6 GHz 3600 XT gained about 1.8%. Adding the memory and the IF tune got us to 128.7 FPS average, a gain of 11% over the 4.6 GHz all-core OC without any further tuning. That also allows the 3600 XT tune to surpass the out-of-box 10600K and the AMD R9 3900X, whose cores matter in this game. The 10600K at 5.1 GHz without a tune holds 135 FPS average, and that's a lead of 4.8% over the tuned 3600 XT. The tuned 10600K finally establishes a 14.4% lead over the tuned 3600 XT, with the same effort invested, Intel remains in the lead, but both parts are good overclockers if willing to spend the time. GTA 5 is next, mostly interesting for its more limited core workload scenarios. In this one, the original 3600 and 3600XT actually had a repeatable and measurable difference, albeit a small one. The XT stock did about 2.6% higher average FPS than the 3600 stock CPU, which is more than in most other games, sadly though that is. The 3600 XT at 4.6 GHz all core also gains 2 FPS. That's not appreciable to a human, it's not something you should really care about, but it's a meaningful change in terms of statistics. The 3600 XT tune ended up at 119 FPS average, gaining 8% over the all core only OC, or 10% over the stock 3600 XT. That also puts it ahead of the 10600K stock CPU and the AMD R9 3900X CPU. The 10600K OC at 5.1 GHz led the XT tune, while the tuned 10600K maintained 134 FPS average, a lead of 13% over the 3600 XT heavily tuned CPU. We won't do many production benchmarks since they don't typically benefit from this kind of work. For example, Blender just really doesn't care. It's entirely thread bound and frequency matters to some extent, but memory outside of having enough of it for complex projects really just doesn't matter that much when it comes to latency. That's more of a gaming type of thing. 7-zip will start us off though, measured in millions of instructions per second. In 7-zip compression, the 3600 XT tune gained more than we typically see in our workstation benchmarks. It's at 61,000 MIPS, a gain of 3.9% over the original 59,000 MIPS score of the 4.6 GHz all-core OC, or 7% over the stock 3600 XT. The 10600K also gained at 59,000 MIPS versus its original score of 53.8,000 MIPS, or 10% over stock. In decompression, the gains are more limited. Actually, there aren't any. <laughs> they're, they're very limited in that sense. The 3600 XT tune performs with an error of the original all-core result at 80,000 MIPS. There's just no advantage here. That's what happens in a lot of these. If the application isn't really interacting with memory on a level that's latency sensitive, 
like it is in games, then the results just don't materialize. The 10600K showed the same response. It's within error, both tuned and with a simple all-core OC at 68,000 to 69,000 MIPS each. We were curious if code compile for the Chromium code base would reflect any difference, because we haven't actually used this test in our memory overclocking features yet, at least not that we've done recently. The answer for this workload appears to be mostly no. We're using Clean CL and Ninja to compile, so please remember that different approaches to compiling different code bases especially, different applications, different operating systems, if you're using distributions of Linux, they all respond differently, so we can't extrapolate this to all programming scenarios. There are probably some that care, but this one didn't. The 3600 XT landed at 113 minutes stock, improving by 5.4% time reduced to 107 minutes with the all-core OC only. It improved another 2% to 105 minutes with the heavy tune. That's not very exciting. That has it just below the 9900K stock, just below the 10700K stock, actually quite below it, and better than the R72700 stock and overclocked from the previous generation. In V-Ray, a renderer like Cycles for Blender, there was a minor uplift. The 3600 XT stock CPU did 11,000 points, the 3600 at 4.3 GHz did about the same, and the 4.6 GHz all-core 3600 XT did 5.6% better than stock. As for our new heavily tuned 3600 XT result, that one landed 8% better than the stock 3600 XT. So that'll wrap it up then as a final reminder, a couple of other notes. You'll see a plus 100 next to the 3600 XT stock number. If you don't know what that means, in the XT review for the 36, what we said was that uh, ours was running about 100 megahertz higher than the official spec, but it was not any kind of weird motherboard cheating going on. It was just actually the silicon's really good quality. So that's what that plus 100 means if you were wondering about that. And uh, this is definitely something we can recommend getting into. You can do all this stuff on the 3600 as well. We tried to apply some of the same tunes to our 3600. It caps out at 4.3, sometimes 4.4 with a really abusive voltage. And for memory, uh, it just, well, I mean, that's mostly the sticks, but the CPU does matter too. You do need memory controllers that are good quality for, for higher clocks. Uh, and better timings. But anyway, that's the end result. It was fun to work on. It's one of the better, actually this is the best AMD Ryzen silicon we've received on a CPU by CPU basis. That doesn't mean all of them are like that. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's worth it either. You should still probably buy a normal 3600 if you're looking to buy in this market. But if you're into really heavy overclocking, you want to do some competitive stuff, then the 3600 XT is awesome for that because you're more or less guaranteed to get higher clocks like we got here for all core. It does more still, we were pretty impressed with some of the performance in more extreme cooling applications as well. So you can check back for that once we get into some liquid nitrogen stuff with the XT series. That'll be it for now. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. And uh, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. We'll see you all next time.